Go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is CVS Santosh and uh, I have a keen interest in international relations. I am currently working as a research assistant to a professor at ISB and uh, I'm very excited to join you guys here today. Hi okay, Santosh, should I also introduce yeah. myself then? Yes, yes Andre, over to you. Sure. Hi. So my name is Andre. I'm originally from Romania. I have studied at the George Washington University, International Security and Philosophy. I also hold a master's in Buddhism from Nalanda University in India. Uh, currently, I work for Close Up Foundation in Virginia, and I hope to have a very lively discussion with Santosh here. Go ahead. If you want to get Thank you very much for, for, for this uh, discussion, Andre. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let's get started. Why don't you start off with your perspective on what's been happening the last few days? I mean, Russia has upped the tensions and US has hit back with sanctions. So yeah, I just wanted to hear the timeline of the Ukrainian conflict according to your perspective. I mean, I think that we have to trace it all back to 2008 when there was the NATO integration summit at Bucharest. The attempt was to integrate Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And that's what really started to add kind of fuel to the fire in the tensions between Russia and the West overall. We see that as a result, not only was the application of Ukraine and um, Georgia rejected from NATO membership, but at the same time, we can also see that um, Russia responded very aggressively, swiftly, and militarily to these uh, Western propositions, right? We see that eventually, even to this day, some regions of eastern Georgia remain annexed altogether yeah. from, from the rest of Georgia. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, so in that sense, we see barricades being put up by the Russians and whatever else. And even today, they're doing the same thing um, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Obviously, there's also the 2014 tensions in Crimea that occurred a few years back. But as of the most recent things that are happening, I mean, the, the regions of Lusang, Dortex, and Kaniv are also now declared by the Russians as autonomous regions. Uh, and here's why this is a dangerous kind of approach. Because once a state can recognize regions as autonomous, this can mean that they can have different foreign policies respective to them, right? The Russians can say, hey, we are technically, yes. yeah, they are technically in that sense saying they are having one foreign political kind of strategy towards the Ukrainians, but they are having at the same time a different, more inclusive foreign policy strategy towards the eastern branches of Ukraine. And these kind of political tactics are not only um, military, military approaches, so to speak, by the Russians, because if you think about it, the Russians have been kind of ongoing a, a psychological strategy throughout Eastern Europe. They were promoting um, pro-Russian parties in the Czech elections, they, even now currently in Macedonia, we see uh, a rising interest towards kind of the Russian culture and whatever else. So in that sense, Russia knows that it's not going to win Eastern Europe th thoroughly through military tactics. There has to be some sense of active involvement, some sort of proto or pseudo civic involvement from the behalf of the um, European locals from their respective states that do indeed support because then Putin can say, hey, see, technically they're not invading. Technically they are not sort of imposing uh, Russian culture, but rather they are just trying to show sympathy towards the people that already support the Russian regime. And that's a very dangerous and successful tactic that Moscow is pulling off simply because it's working. And there are aspects of Eastern Europe that do become in, in higher favor and support of what Putin is trying to do, right? I mean, in their imagination, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest mistake of human natural history. So, well, I mean, it, it's pretty yeah. transparent that they're trying to restore some aspects of the old Soviet Union. Um, it, let's see, I mean, it, it's now up to states such as Romania and, and Poland to really be able to manage and contain at least some of these cultural developments. There's not as much pro-Russian sentiment in Romania or in Poland. If anything, we are still remaining aligned with the Union and the NATO allies. So in that sense, it's going to be interesting to see how these events uh, develop and unfold. There's always the risk of a migration crisis and overflow, right? Given the geographical proximity of Poland and Romania, we see 
that there is the potentiality of a high risk of migration into these states. So um, now it's just a matter of waiting and see where these sanctions are going. That's a very interesting point you raise, Andre. The fact that um, Poland and Romania are going to bear the demographic brunt of whatever happens down there. I'm just curious to know your views as to how the divisions within Ukraine, how do you think they will play out in the political calculus of Putin and the US? For instance, there are genuinely a, a, a number of Ukrainians who want to join the uh, NATO, who want to join the EU, but there are also Ukrainians in the eastern parts, especially around the areas around Donetsk and Luhansk, who are sympathetic to the Russian cause or to the to, or to Putin's propaganda, right? So yeah. how do you expect this? So uh, the way I see it, Ukraine is like a house divided in itself. So how do you see that impacting the situation on the ground and the strategy of US and Russia, maybe? Good. So maybe I'll start with the military aspect. There has been no substantial push from the Western powers to include Ukraine and NATO since 2008. There has been no major application. There has been no major convention or movement that would say, hey, uh, the Western powers are willing to reconsider the integration of Ukraine into NATO. Um, so in that sense, given the silence since 2008, I don't think that there's much of a reason to believe that that is an active or live option for the Ukrainians. However, beneficial it would be um, because as the result of the occupation of Crimea, we also would not want to further push for uh, unwanted consequences that lead to some sort of military um, tension. As for these kind of cultural aspects, because as you said, there's an East Ukraine, there's a West Ukraine and whatever else. I mean, look, the Ukrainian church completely separated in a very surprising schism from the Moscow uh, Byzantine church. I mean, right, I mean, Putin's kind of argument here is, look, we are not just trying to restore um, some sort of grandiose project of the old Soviet Union, but this is about pan-Slavism, right? This is about some sort of um, geographical Slavic unity that is ethnic, that is linguistic, that is religious, that has other kind of denotations for the common, uh, you know, Eastern European. It's not just about some grandiose geostrategic policies, but we see that the Ukrainian church is not necessarily happy with this pan-Slavic movement. And if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2017 or 2018 that the Ukrainian patriarchs completely said that they refused to continue being under the patriarchal jurisdiction of Moscow, right? And we haven't seen such huge religious movements since, I mean, arguably the Great Schism of 1054 has been, you know, the, the Byzantine churches of the East have been quite unanimously united for give or take a thousand years, despite the wars and the tensions and the two world wars and whatever else. Even during the two world wars themselves, we have not seen such a rapture and separation in what Slavic Byzantine identity is. So if you are a Ukrainian Orthodox believer, uh, and you align with the views of the patriarchs and the heads of the church, chances are is that you deny Putin's pan-Slavic narrative, and you would rather prefer to preserve your own kind of individual identity as you, as a state. As So now there's like this growing cultural distinction that I don't think gets sufficient attention between what does it mean to be a Ukrainian Byzantine Orthodox and what does it mean to be a Russian Byzantine Orthodox, right? Because Putin seems to win on these kinds of um, residual historical narratives, but he doesn't really pay attention to what the religious consequences could be of that. So in that sense, well, what is the outcome? I think an interesting scenario that is also not being discussed is the potential to have a Berlin scenario again, right? The last time we have seen in Europe that a country is blocked halfway through between Western ideas and Eastern ideas has been Germany. It has, it has been post-World War II Germany when the English, the French, and the Americans seized West Germany, and then the communist forces have seized the East, right? And then we have seen the rise of the Berlin Wall. So arguably, there is a scenario where Ukraine might up in the same position, where there is some internal geopolitical schism in Ukraine. We'll see the Western Ukrainians align further with the West and then the Eastern Ukrainians align further with the Russians. But who knows, really? Well, that's a very interesting 
term that you used, residual historical um, uh, issues. And I, so just to add on to that, so just a follow up question. First of all, how likely do you think is the possibility of a schism within the Ukrainian nation? And my second question to you would be, uh, there have been allegations from uh, certain media sections, especially the Russian propaganda and some verifiable uh, Western news sources as well, that a lot of these neo-nationalists who were behind the Maidan movement or who are currently or, or who are currently leading the offensive against Russian troops, a number of them have been accused of being neo-Nazis, especially by uh, Russia Today and such related outlets, right? So I would be, uh, so now just so finally to present my question, I would just be very interested to know your thoughts on A, what do you think about these allegations of those Ukrainian nationalists being neo-Nazis as well, or to what extent do neo-Nazis comprise those Ukrainian nationalists, A, given that, and uh, B, given the allegations of neo-Nazism and given the, sh the schism that you were potentially talking about along the lines of the East and West Germany and the division of Berlin, how likely do you think that scenario is going to play up in the coming days? Especially given that US is imposing sanctions, but Russia is kind of prepared for it. Um, US, I don't think is going to intervene militarily. But so, what do you take? What do, what are your takes on these three issues? Yeah, neo-Nazism. Sure. Good. Yeah. Very good question. So, <clears throat> okay, as far as these Russian propaganda things, even though, as I mentioned earlier, there is some decentralized Russian agenda to increase population and general support for Russian activities in Eastern Europe is working. At the same time, it's important to know that the Russians also still perform cyber attacks on Ukraine, right? And when we kind of try to trace and do the ascriptive mechanisms for, well, why and how were the Ukrainians targeted by the Russians, it's not on the same grounds that the way um, us Americans were affected here, for example, right? We don't see Russian electoral interference in Eastern Europe through DDoSs and fake tweets and whatever else. What we see is them hard targeting the military equipment and the infrastructure of the country. The Russians have no uh, political ambitions as far as what we can see, uh, but who knows? There's a lot of questions of who really runs Russia besides Putin, and maybe that's for another day. But as far as Russian ambitions towards Ukraine, it's not just simply generating this East-West ideological split. They're, they still maintain very rigorous, um, you know, cyber offensive capabilities towards the Ukrainians, right? So in that sense, there's no reason to believe, at least externally, that the Russians only have um, ideological ambitions in that sense. Um, as far as the neo-Nazis, a few things on this uh, in the Ukrainians. Firstly, um, it has been a hot button issue with the NATO forces as well, because NATO was, uh, forces were put in the predicament of, hey, these are uh, reasonably trained people that have some military background, they have some defensive capabilities, and they want to serve along the lines of the NATO forces. These people, let's just call them people for now, and then I'll explain why these ideas are so ambiguous. So these folks yeah. openly wanted to discuss a cooperative tactical strategy with NATO forces to defend the northern and eastern borders of Ukraine. NATO said no, because they do see these sorts of pseudo neo-Nazi affiliations with them, and NATO is extraordinarily anti-Nazism. If anything, you know, NATO has emerged as a result of opposing Nazi forces to some extent. Um, so in that sense, I mean, this is where it gets complicated, right? Because if we look at Germany today, this is a, a golden age of geopolitics for Germany because Germany has not been surrounded by allies uh, before in Eastern Europe, right? I mean, they're on decent terms with Pol the Polish and the French and the Italians and the, and the Romanians and the English, which is historically unheard of as far as German security politics are concerned, right? So Germany is most definitely in a privileged position. Now, what does this mean for the actual engagement with these uh, uh, seemingly far-right people of Ukraine? Look, it's very hard to designate these communist and Nazi affiliations in Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe has always been at the crossroads of both 
ideologies. It's very easy when we speak of Germans to say that they might have a neo-Nazi bent. It's very easy to speak of Russians as having neo-Stalinist bents, right? But it's also important not to conflate and confuse that being anti-Stalinist in Eastern Europe does not make you a neo-Nazi as such, right? The, the, the heavy historical burdens that Stalin has imposed on Eastern Europe is not something that everybody remembers as a beautiful picture, as a glorious pan-Slavic Soviet memory in that sense, right? I mean, there are people that indeed do glorify the, the former um, social political fabric of the Soviets and they wish it was back, even perhaps in Ukraine and other places of Eastern Europe. But if you look at um, you know, again, Poland, for example, Poland is very vocal about opposing both, and there's even been some interesting tensions with, with uh, Eastern, uh, the European court as well, in a couple of months ago, as far as they, I think they were going to be fined 1 million euros or something along those lines for not allowing sufficient uh, jurisdiction from the EU courts to actually impose some regulatory aspects on, on the Polish uh, governmental system. So this is actually a very dense question. Um, again, being anti-Stalin in Eastern Europe does not make you a neo-Nazi as such. Uh, do I personally believe that they have Nazi affiliations? Uh, they could, they, they might as well could. I'm not here to speak on their behalf. I don't know enough about, right? I haven't lived with them. I, I don't know the books that they read or the things that they talk about or whatever else. But we should also be mindful that the media is very good at uh, scripting these big controversial labels to people just to clickbait, right? Just to get some views, just to kind of have a distorted conversation going. And I think that's unfair to Eastern Europeans um, because I don't think the Western media fully understands the weighing burden that we have whenever we are placed between these crossroads. I think that we are such in a strict dichotomy of either or, either or that we forget to see that there can be also this neti neti approach, right? This neither nor approach. We, we can be anti-Stalin and anti-Hitler without being either a neo-Nazi or a neo-Soviet as such, right? And this is part of the identity struggle that a lot of Eastern Europeans are having today because we have been in some sense exposed to both ideologies and we are firsthand exposed to these ideologies, right? The second world of, of uh, 20th century nations was the Soviet satellite states, right? So in that sense, it, it's a very thick, um, kind of cognitive imprint that some people have managed to sort through by simply saying, look, we are now members of the European Union, problem solved, we have our national identity, we have our uh, pan-European identity, and we're done. But in countries that are more geopolitically contested, um, like Ukraine, it's very, it's even harder to see these delineation, uh, these kind of um, distinctions in that sense, right? I mean, we don't, um, I mean, for example, when the United States sends um, military operations or when they send particular troops in the Middle East, they usually send also kind of anthropologists with them that speak a Syriac language that try to give a human, a human face to the military operations of the United States in the Middle East. They, they send people that speak the Syriac languages, right? That try to engage with the local people and remind them that they are there to be protected from the forces of terrorism or something along those lines, right? But there's no... Uh, anthropologists with a high specialization on the ethnic identities and post-Soviet residual consciousness of Eastern Europeans or something along those lines, right? We don't, we don't see Western anthropology departments pushing for this idea that, look, there's no such thing as a pan-Slavism. I mean, even if you do security studies at any American institution, I can't speak on the behalf of other institutions, but <laughs> at least in American institutions, if you do, um, if you do engage with Eastern European security politics, all you get is Russian studies. To, to be successful, to be a successful analyst in the United States at Eastern Europe, you just have to know Russian. You don't have to care about Polish history or Czech history or Romanian history or Yugoslav or post-Yugoslavic history or Greek or anything along those lines. To, to the West, Eastern Europe is just Russia, right? The, it, it's such a academically ambiguous and poorly constructed notion that people would obviously neglect this. So I hope that answers that, uh, you know, that problem of identity and delineation and whatever else you want to call them. As far as the sanctions absolutely. and... Hmm? Go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So yeah. I agree with you. I think that does answer the question. And uh, what you seem to suggest is that the current Ukrainian nationalists some of them could have anti-Semitic associations, but 
to dub them as neo nazi just because of their opposition to russia would be wrong so i think i kind of yeah i think i do uh, get the answers from what you said yes that absolutely makes sense and coming to sanctions you had something to say andre please i mean as far as sanctions we have seen sanctions work in the past um towards the russians whenever they try to push for aggressive behavior but Here's the thing, Russia has gained far more resource in the fields of energy infrastructure and energy security relative to the other European states. I mean, the Germans have been having a lot of open-ended deals as far as gas and whatever else. And even still to this day, most of Europe, especially the Eastern portion is still very dependent on Russian gas. So in the same way that we are all dependent more or less on Taiwan for manufacturing chips, right? These are the kind of 21st century precious resources that can dictate global economies. And I'm really not trying to understate that by any means. I think they really, these resources are that significant, right? The, the Arab world has their petrol, the East Asians have their chips, and the, the Eastern Europeans have the gas, right? So in that sense, these, these critical resources that, that shape global infrastructure and trade and economy are definitely an important um, piece of the puzzle or piece on the chessboard, if you want to look at it that way. And the Russians definitely have the leverage here. And America is never going to suffer the cost of losing gas the way the European allies or Eastern Europe is going to have to suffer the cost. So here it's kind of a toss up and a gamble towards the United States. It's like, sure, they, do they have the um, hegemonic capacity and diplomatic wits and, and whatever other leverage they can have to have the power to impose these sanctions on Russia? Sure. Uh, or mainly, who's, but who's going to suffer from these sanctions? Mainly Russian civilians, right? Russian millionaire oligarchs are going to stay totally unaffected by, by these sanctions. Um, and eventually the, the greater burdening cost is going to just fall on people that are dependent to Russian gas, which again is a lot of Europeans, be it in NATO or not. So I'm not sure how the United States is willing to undergo that cost benefit analysis because yes, they can impose them. There's no cost to the United States but it does affect the Europeans. So, and the Europeans are still kind of religiously going to align with the United States as such, right? They're still going to always opt for um, the capacity of the United States more than uh, Putin's ambitions. So who knows? Yeah, uh, thank you for the response, Andre. That was pretty illuminating. And uh, in response to that, um, uh, to, whatever you just said right now, from Russia's perspective right now, Ukraine apparently seems to be like the red line which he's drawing in the sand now, because from the Russian perspective, NATO did not dissolve after the collapse of USSR. Instead, NATO kept expanding right up till Russia's doorstep. So people in some quarters could argue that perhaps Putin is not doing the right thing and is genuinely upsetting the international order. However, he has been given grounds, so to speak, uh, because of historical injustices related to the eastward expansion of NATO. So uh, given this situation and given the fact that Russia currently is now significantly equipped to weather sanctions, even for the domestic population, which I agree will bear the brunt of the sanctions and will suffer, no doubt. But given that Russia has prepared for such an eventuality since the 2014 Donbass invasion, and uh, given that attempts to dislocate them from the financial world is not going to work anytime soon, I am just interested to know uh, what do you think would be the the Russian reaction right now, because from the average Russian's perspective, sure, going to war with Ukrainians isn't good, because at the end of the day, identity or not, they're still Slavs, but we do have the financial wherewithal to bear the sanctions, and we do need to resist NATO, and we do need to get them to promise never to include NATO, and then we can all go back to the situation as it was, where Russia doesn't have to worry about Ukraine being used as the staging board for US missiles. So uh, don't you think that there could actually be a groundswell of support for Putin? And much harder for neutral countries like India or you know non other non-line countries to actually set this one out. So I would be really interested to know what are your thoughts on these. 
I know sure. it's a lot, but uh, yeah. No, that that's fine. So you are right that that actually is even Putin himself said this. He is angry at the NATO agenda because they promised that they won't expand eastward after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Those words also came out of his mouth. Well, in Russian, but you get the point, right? So in that yeah, sense, yeah. I mean, that is the view of, of Russian leadership as far as they're justifying reasons for countering uh, these, they're just protecting, right, the pan-Slavic story that they are pushing for. They're actually not trying to force NATO into anything. Putin's arguments are always that they um, are only reacting defensively to NATO expansion. Yes. Putin yes, always yes, makes yes. the argument that it's like, look, they never started anything substantial. They never pushed for military aggression in Belarus or in Poland or in the former Stan satellites of West Asia or whatever else. Putin is just saying, look, they left them alone. They, they have their autonomous self-determination as nation states. They are only trying to protect whatever interest they have from the um, from the Western aggression, aggressive expansionism as such and whatever else. So yeah, that is a definitely a legitimate position. Now, what does this mean for uh, the local Russians, right? The civilian Russians, as you said. Well, how does the local Russian population feel about this? My observations are that there's two types of Russian attitudes in the same way that there's two generally broad um, kind of terms. There's the left and the right in that sense, right? The the ultra pro-Stalinist, there's still a lot of uh, Russian lobbyists that are pushing for building more Stalin statues in Russian public spaces. When the local civilians are interviewed, they're saying, yes, this is part of the glorious Soviet history. And uh, they as Russians should remember the unifying and glorious victories that Stalin had over, um, right? And the story goes from there. So in that sense, there is still a very powerful and thick kind of pro-Stalinist attitude uh, amongst Russians. And this, this goes at all generations. This is not necessarily, oh, it's just the elderly that are uh, missing the, the piece here. You, there's also young generations from our generation as well, that there's people, um, civilians in Russia that would hold that, that view. So that is definitely still active. And I'm sure they're like kind of buying into the Putin narrative of them just being defensive and protecting their uh, pan-Slavic interests or whatever else. Um, but there's also a lot of liberals. Um, there is a growing liberal population. Even since 2012, 2013, there were pro-LGBT marches on Moscow. I mean, they got shot down very quickly, the way Tiananmen Square got shot down very quickly. But there is a growing momentum. I mean, the, the liberal demographic of Russia is suffering from the same things that the Hungarian liberal demographic is suffering from. I mean, Orban and, and, and Putin are basically having the same approaches of like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You're too yeah. young. Don't give into these Western liberal ambitions stick with your own people and, and generate that sense of nationalism it will benefit you in the long run and whatever else so I mean there's more liberal academic spaces in Russia also now they're also hosting American instructors to kind of teach on foreign policy history and and, and theory and whatever else and that sense there is a more open audience of of Russian academia of, of civilians that do hold more western bent values uh, what are the proportions exactly? I cannot tell you. I, I have not taken an active qualitative or quantitative survey of Russian demographic to see the percentage of how many of them are pro-Stalinist and how many of them are okay with globalization and integration and whatever else. On the Russian, on the Ukrainian missile possibility that you were talking about, well, first of all, Ukraine had their own missiles and their own nuclear weapons and then there were some tensions in the 80s and the 90s and they somehow ended up back with the Russians. So in that sense, this is a very easy finger point of, well, you started this kind of thing, right? Ukrainians do maintain some historical right to say this. Um, they had their own nuclear capacities until things got a little rough with the Soviets and the Western tensions of back then. Um, currently, though, the Biden administration invited um, Russian inspectors in their bases of Poland and Romania to see that there are no active nuclear weapons at any military bases in Romania and Poland. So I'm not really sure if any Russian leadership is going to take that invitation, nor am I entirely sure what Biden and his administration are thinking about this. But it's definitely interesting to see that Biden saying, look, we are trying to offer you here a type of transparency that you are refusing to acknowledge because you're stuck into these, you know, realpolitik 19th century kind of tactics, right? So, oh, 
that is still a pending live issue. The Russian administration has not responded to my knowledge yet to these invitations. So it is up for the foreseeable weeks, maybe months to see, maybe, maybe not months, but definitely in the foreseeable weeks, maybe we'll be able to see something intriguing about it. But here's something speaking of Russia's position relative to India and the West and the United States and whatever else. I really think Mearsheimer was right here. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, for example, I mean, there was already still some decent relations between India and, and Russia back then since the 60s with Nehru. Nehru really popularized and tried to have this openly secular, that was, that was, that was Nehru's vision, right? He was openly secular. Um, he wanted India to be more secular than it is today. He wanted to align with the Russians because he sympathized the, the, the kind of secular features that, that Soviet governance had at the time. So, you know, Russo-Indian relations have always been pretty interesting to look at and analyze in that sense. Uh, but what Mearsheimer is saying, and I do think he's correct about this, uh, maybe not about everything, but I definitely think he got this one right, which is America messed up its foreign policy strategy towards Russia and China when the time was ripe in the mid and the late 20th century. Um, America overly invested in the Chinese economy in the hopes that it will liberally transform into a magical human rights cosmopolitan universe, which obviously didn't happen. Um, you know, they're, they're just as thickly Maoist now as they were in 1911, if not, it, I mean, China's always an interesting case to talk about because it, it raises a lot of question marks for political scientists, but at least as far as strategically, militarily, and whatever else, if you want to look at it that way, I mean, there were options for um, the United States to not pursue containment, but rather integration as such. I mean, when Eastern Europe was defragmented and so many things were collapsing and so many you know, dominoes were falling from 89 to 92, 93, that, that was a very interesting time for the United States and the Soviet Union to form an unwanted friendship in the same way that the English and the French formed an unwanted friendship after a thousand years of being at each other's throats at war. Uh, we see right the, the developments of the Entente at the beginning of World War One, which were kind of weird surprises, if you don't mind me saying it that way. I mean, <clears throat> if you were a civilian in you know the early 1900s, if you were either French or English, and then you see them all of a sudden being friends after being fed national propaganda and internal cultures of saying, hey, we are at war with these people and we've been at war with these people for a thousand years and now all of a sudden we're friends. So that kind of raises a lot of questions. I mean, it would basically be the same with you know, Indian relations towards Turkey and uh, and England and whatever else. It's kind of like this ironic, this this kind of ironic historical plot twist, if you want to look at them that way. Um, so okay. th there there could have been better outcomes. There definitely could have been better scenarios as far as American foreign policy strategy. I mean, here's the thing, because America kind of slipped through the Indo-Pakistani tensions since '47. Right. I mean, if you look at it, the United States didn't even know who to align themselves with, even after 9-11. They're like, uh, should we opt for the Pakistanis and have a closer look on the counterterror operations and we have a cleaner corridor into, into you know, Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Afghanistan? Or do we align with India for ideological reasons? They have a bigger demographic. They have the more promising future, um, whatever else. Right. <clears throat> so America is very confused about Asian politics, I think, even to this day. Um, in that sense, uh, should have the United States, when they were in a greater geopolitical spot with greater military leverage globally, should have the United States invested in India in the 1950s and the 60s, um, should have uh, the United States kind of work towards uh, integrating Russia, I mean, not make them part of NATO, that would have been a very, you know, pro maybe too much of an idealistic aspiration that, but there could have been much cleaner playouts between the United States and Russia in that aspect. And should have the United States not funded China to become the monster that it is today, uh, we would have lived in much more interesting geostrategic uh, times than we are now. But mistakes were made on both sides of the globe and we just have to live with the consequences. That's a very interesting take and a number of useful, interesting parallels and a lot of historical issues that you raise that are very relevant even today. Uh, my next question would, would to you be something along these lines. So we already know that the Donetsk and Luhansk have been recognized as independent republics. Uh, Putin has prepared the country for sanctions. Biden is planning uh, isolating Russia from the global financial system. 
so given this current situation my my one question to you would be how do you see this impacting the european union in the future years like because like you because you also took the interesting example of viktor orban who even though hungary is a part of eu but he is a very conservative politician and similarly if i'm not mistaken uh, i think even in eastern europe politicians in poland or uh, i can't speak for any other place though but even they have shown opposition to you know the western bloc in the eu you know like we will not accept more refugees we are not going to liberalize as far as lgbtq are concerned so eastern europe as a place remains conservative culturally even if their political aspirations align more towards the west so a uh, very interesting point you raised earlier that you know eastern europeans are a people whose identities are always you know in a flux between yeah we do want to be part of western liberal democracy and capitalist system but we don't want gays and we want traditional family values so given this how do you think the european union is going to get impacted and specifically i would be very interested to know how do you think eastern european countries like poland and romania how are they going to be impacted as far as their foreign policy or strategy concerned so i mean if you bring the discussion to eu as well and just one last remark germany has already suspended uh, the nord stream 2 pipeline and uh, like you mentioned earlier regardless of all a third observer can uh, can definitely uh, view eu post eu stance as just mere posturing given the dependence on gas given the historical tensions given that poland estonia and the baltic nations and romania are still there so yeah just what are your comments on european union the future of europe uh, and the impact on eastern european countries like poland or romania yeah good i mean nobody has a crystal ball to foresee the future of the european union i am still to some extent surprised although i shouldn't be at brexit i mean yes there's the typical explanations of oh oh anti eu sentiments oh the english were always on an island oh they always felt somehow geographically separated from the rest of the union oh they miss their empire day so much that they'd rather be independent even though that means signing 500 page you know books on how to effectively trade with the eu and travel regulations and whatever else but i don't think those arguments are sufficiently substantial to just justify exactly why brexit happened oh, you know in that sense i think that there there are much much thicker ambitions by the english there uh, i mean that are just inherently arrogant i mean the english are known for being arrogant given their imperial historical legacy and that didn't stop them from even thinking that they're better than the whole union altogether oh i don't think poland has that complex or romania i don't think we've ever put ourselves into some sort of Uh, such a powerful nationalistic position that we would completely neglect collective European interests, um, but there has been rumors of a poll exit when those initial cases and those judicial reviews came from the European Court. Uh, there is a lot of poll exit marches um, in Warsaw and Krakow and whatever else. So. I mean, getting fined one million euros is a decent chunk of money. So, in that sense, there is a lot of live debates now between, well, to what extent should the um, European courts have some sort of judicial superimposition and capacities to influence domestic laws? That's always been a work in progress. There's that's always contingency relative. That's always something that is going to further affect uh, what Europe means, either you know, semantically, culturally, politically, fiscally, judicially, and all the isms, right? I think that the way that the European Union will evolve and with potential integration of other states, if that will ever happen again, um, that that's just we'll have to wait and see. Um, as far as the refugee crisis well there was a refugee crisis right before this and through belarus and poland when they were trying to get into germany and whatever else and it was a huge humanitarian disaster there were people freezing to death and at the border uh, un troops couldn't get in because the there was such a conservative backlash from local police and and other security services so in that sense we we have no reason to believe that liberalizing eastern europe is going to happen overnight nor do we have a reason to believe that um the european union has such a powerful leverage tool to you know persuade 
traditional Eastern values to completely disappear from the minds of Eastern Europeans. I also kind of think that's nonsensical. Uh, the East-West splits have happened way before the two world wars. They've happened way before the European Union was even conceived. Uh, the East-West splits have originally happened when the Roman Catholic Church decided to not be uh, the same as the Byzantine Church, and arguably those tensions trace even further before that. In the same way that you know the tensions of World War One were also things that have piled up over decades. So I mean, even even a novice historian can trace these East Western European tensions at least to the eighth century, if not to the Roman Empire as such. Right. So in that sense, there's no there's no reason to believe that. Look, we cannot defer to a united Europe because there never was a united Europe as such. It was always sufficiently fragmentized and divided, and it somehow works due to mutual economic and security interests, right? So, I mean, I don't think the North-South Indian problem is analogous here. I think those are more kind of like identity questions and strictly linguistic questions and whatever else. India overall has always basically had more or less to me the same geopolitical interests, right? Most likely anti-Mughal, most likely anti-English, anti-Dutch, anti-whatever, right? So at least you see some consistency internally with North-South Indian divergences when it comes to politics and security and whatever else. But we can't say the same thing about Europeans, right? I mean, Eastern European values and Western European values are much more divergent than North Indian values and South Indian values as such, even if we put away the linguistic differences and the whatever else, right? So. Um, as far as the refugee crisis is concerned, I mean, it's really, you know, the Polish and the Czechs and the Germans that are going to be most affected by it. If, if you look at what the migrants were shouting that were crossing from Belarus through Poland, they just said, Germany, Germany, they want to go to Germany. Nobody said, we want to stay in Poland, we want to go to Romania, we want to go to Greece or Serbia or something, right? So, I mean, they want to go to the rich, prolific countries that offers them opportunity. They don't want to come to us. We're poor. We are, you know, in a much, in a much more vulnerable and economically unstable position than Germany, right? If you migrate, you want what's best. You want to offer yourself the best opportunities. You want to offer your family the best opportunities. And Romania and Poland will not have the economic capacity to offer the best opportunities to the Germans. Even Romanian and Polish people mainly migrate and we have the same brain drain problem that Indians have. There's a lot of extraordinarily brilliant Indians, but the Indian monetary system and educational system is not going to keep them, right? They go to North America, they go to the Anglo states, they, they settle there and then they eventually most likely choose not to come back. So in that sense, there is some loose similarity here between capacities, talent, and whether or not you can keep it. And um, you know, Romania and Poland are not in a fiscal position to keep nor desire them either. So that's at least on refugees. As far as liberalization, I mean, this just takes time. It really does. I mean, values always change in that sense. And Shantosh, think about it. Like there's, there's no reason to believe one way or the other one. There's always going to be conservatives and liberals in every state. And whoever has the more money and the more demographics is going to push for their relative agenda. This is not an ethnic issue to me. This is not a national issue. This is not a continental issue. These are just, political human decisions nature. relative to human nature this to me is a human nature problem it's people that will have the money and the power and the leverage and the demographic support will push for their side of the political spectrum this is not something that it's like this is uniquely oh oh do you want your tanks to say they and them or not uh, or not on them kind of thing you know this is not this is not necessarily something that can be contained in a sheer explanation this is about people this is about um forms of activity and choices and preference and i'm always surprised what things withstand the test of time or not i mean look at religion and how far it's come and how thick it is and how it's still willing to stay right we talk about pan-slavism and the byzantine identity there's the bjp there's the rss there's all of these very thickly committed people to very profoundly devout religious identities that i somehow wonder like what's inside their head? How do they rationalize the world? How do they see the world? Why do they see such a significant value for their well-being into religious practices, right? So to some extent, you know, look at the Sri Lankan attitudes towards, you know, Muslims and whatever else. I mean, and the list goes on forever. So and I can't fully justify, you know, I'm not, 
uh, I think, sufficiently trained in philosophy to explain to you what is it in human nature that leads to this inevitability of preserving religious practices. Maybe it's the aesthetics, maybe it's the promises of a, um, a heaven or, or whatever else, or the moksha or the nirvana, or maybe it's that promise of being completely free from human suffering and human problems and whatever else that really pushes them forward. And Religion has has won many hearts and minds through our world history. So I am not entirely sure uh, what values are going to stay in society and what values we're going to disparage of. I mean, every age, every cycle has their ups and downs and their peaks and whatever else. So I'm not entirely sure how to respond to that beyond this. As far as Romanian and Polish foreign policy strategy, we will always stay committed to NATO. We will always stay committed to the West. We will always um, be anti-Russian. That, that is just set in stone. There, there is no money in the world. There is no military leverage in the world. There is no cultural innovation that Putin and company can conceive to persuade the Romanians and the Poles to realign with the old Soviet system. There is literally nothing they can do. Uh, Poland and Romania are devout members of the union. Poland and Romania and, and company are definitely going to preserve NATO strategy, NATO ambitions, alliances with the West. Uh, uh, even historically, the Western powers have been much more helpful um, toward, towards us than, than anything that the Russians can offer. So in that sense, I see no reason to believe that uh, the four, th this is just going to be integrated in status quo realpolitik. These are fixed alliances as far as I'm concerned. These are non-negotiables. So. so one last question, and um, uh, after that, of course, I would be very much uh, want. I would very much want to listen to your thoughts after that. But one last question: Who do you think is going to walk away from this conflict with the gains? Is it going to be Russia, or is it going to be U.S. and EU? Like, if you had to do a sobering real politic analysis, how do you see this plan uh, panning out? Like, sure. I mean, as far as that. Um the pipelines between Russia and, and Germany being suspended. And look, I mean, this is only temporary because there's only this much that Germany and the rest of Europe has to be energy independent until we become again reliant on Russian gas as such. So this is more of, you know, easing tensions, the Germans showing that they still have an allegiance to the West and they haven't sold themselves out to Putin or something like that. Uh, there's no reason to believe that that pipeline will remain shut for longer than a year because the gas is going to run out. These are scarce limited resources. We don't have uh, innumerably many capacities of obtaining them either. Um, as far as, well, who's the winner? Well, it depends what we mean by winning in that sense. Uh, there, there's no... There's no grandiose Cold War style, you know, we're fighting with ideas or we're fighting for a space race or we're fighting for geopolitical supremacy. All right. So, all right. So, if that's a very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Last question then. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. So, just uh, so uh, you raised a very interesting point there define winning. So, I think from the Russian perspective, uh, getting commitments from the Ukrainian government on not joining the European Union and on not joining the NATO would definitely be a huge win for the Russians, regardless of how hard the sanctions hit them. Whereas US would consider it a win if the Russians pull back and not threaten Ukraine any further, which is obviously not gonna happen. So the best that they can hope for is uh, to somehow guide and enable Ukraine to resolve their differences without joining the EU or the NATO. Now, as far as the as far as the European Union is concerned, there is I don't think there is winning for anybody, because uh, this episode has essentially kind of laid bare the geopolitical realities that Germany is too dependent on Russia. The rest of uh, France, which could have been the only country to stand up to Russia, has just been snubbed by Putin, and the rest need to uh, band together in order to have any hope of even withstanding Russia. So I see Russia to be in a very advantageous position here and much more likely to achieve its political aims. Because let's not forget that, like Clausewitz said, right? Like war is politics by other means. So it is conceivable that uh, prolonged diplomatic and economic tensions could result, you know, in like a, in, you know, in like, in, in like a sort of a war of attrition which Putin can sit and wait out. I'm sure he has the patience and the ability for it. So uh, that's my opinion. Uh, I could, of course, be wrong, but I would be very interested to know your comments on 
uh, who do you think is going to get what? Who do you think is most likely to walk away with the biggest prize? Sure. How about uh, the prize may be different? I mean, firstly, I just want to kind of add on to what you were saying about the decentralized problem with the Western powers, because Russia acts as one entity. There's Putin and company, yeah. and that's it. The Western powers have to coordinate. There's the United States and the French and the English and the Germans and, and so on and so on, right? So it is much easier to make decisions when there's only one entity that has the authority. When the power is split and there's deliberation necessary, there's going to be inconsistencies, there's going to be disagreements, there's going to be many other factors that what an authoritarian regime doesn't have to deal with. So in that sense, Russia is always going to be more responsive and more effective because there's just less deliberation involved as far as what the decision is from the authoritative point of view of a military operation. I, I mean, the... Um, you know, the English and the French are a little more aggressive, which favor the United States, uh, and, and so on and so on. The more, the closer we get to the East, the, the lower threshold of aggression is going to be, because the lower you get to the East, the more of that residual mind that you see of uh, them actually being impacted by Soviet policies in the past, and they are more firsthand aware of how capable Russian forces are, so they kind of know to play the slower game, the, the more diplomatic bent. So, approaches before they resort. I mean, sure, the West, the Western Europeans and the United States also opts for diplomacy first, but I think that the Eastern Europeans would be a little even more keen on pushing for diplomacy, even when there would be scenarios by which the, the Western playbook would say this is grounds for military and tactical aggression. So we have to consider that. Um, as far as, well, who gets what and who wins and who loses uh, and what is at stake, well, there's no reason to believe that we're not going to see the annexation of the Eastern regions somehow slowly but surely fading away from the capacities of the Ukrainians to govern them. I think that's really the, the, the costs that we have to look at as far as well, what kind of, because here's the problem. Whenever we talk about Eastern European politics, and even you and I have kind of given into this paradigm of, well, what is US doing? What, is, what are the French doing? What are the Russians doing? But who is really at the center of the issue? It's Ukraine. So if we really have to look at wins and losses, we have to look at the Ukrainians first. And then we can see how the rest of the powers consider their deliberations and their victories and losses. What is Ukraine losing? I think that's the more important question here. Well, first of all, Ukraine is losing authority over its own mainland, which is the biggest loss of this discussion of these events. Um, you know, there were some NATO officials that put it very well yesterday. This is the biggest security issue of the 21st century. Since the inception of NATO, we have not been so close to a brink of a hot war as we ha have been in the last couple of days. Um, so there's definitely some things that should not be undervalued or underplayed or uh, be caught into, you know, ascription and labels and, and media hot buttons, but actually see the practical consequences of this. So I think the Ukrainians have the biggest loss as such, regardless of who benefits, be it the Russians or, or some, some, someone else in that sense. I mean, um, losing uh, administrative and governmental capacity over your own mainland is a threat to your self-determination as a nation state, right? It kind of destabilizes your capacity to internally administer your finances, your trade, your infrastructure, your educational policies, your health policies, blah, blah. So in that sense, um, you know, well, I think the, the effects of the loss on the Ukrainians is greater than the winning aspects that it could have on behalf of the Russians, to put it simply. I, I think that this is not about, um, about who wins more, but who lost more and who's winning out of that big loss kind of thing. I mean, Russians don't benefit from the annexation of these regions as much as Ukraine is going to suffer from these losses kind of thing. Like these are not equivalent. These are not proportionate trade-offs as such. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. that's what I'm trying to Thank you for to pointing that out. Yeah. yeah. So as far as uh, the rest of the world, so to speak, I mean, it just shows limits of diplomatic negotiation. It, we haven't seen too much boots on the ground. I mean, we, we have seen plenty to be worried, but we have not seen an actual combat as such, right? So um, we can't say that these are the calculated risk aversive policies and tactics of either NATO or the Russians, right? We cannot uh, analyze that far. And I think if you are, you're kind of misleading into irrational problems of, you know, um, 
caveating some things as far as well what what does this mean for the west well Romania is just going to increase its defensive capabilities this is openly accessible to all kind of NATO channels as such even before the Trump 2% uh, kind of arguments, Romania has been, since 2014, Romania has been increasing its Navy and military presence and, you know, relative to the Ukrainian mainland because they're our neighbor, right? So that's the kind of awkward sandwich that Poland and Romania have to deal with because we are basically sandwiching Ukraine geopolitically. So um, as far as, well, who wins? Well, we... The only thing that you can call victorious as such on the behalf of the West is not to underestimate the Russians, to finally come to the realization that the um, neoliberal promises of a cosmopolitan future are over. I think that uh, this is a wake up call to realize the force of illiberal politics, be it Russian or Chinese or um, whatever else. Um, I think it's important to realize that. I mean, I'm not trying to make the argument that, look, democracy is not for everyone. Some states are better off not being democratic. That's none of my business to each their own, even as far as them having the right to project a particular uh, desired state. If Ukrainians want democracy, they should have democracy. If Ukrainians don't want democracy, then they should not have democracy. But we should not give in to the Putin narrative spinoffs either of like, well, you see, this is the problem, because if they don't want democracy, that means they want the Russians and hooray. So there's always that kind of yeah. weighing mechanism that we have to consider when, when we think about state building or state preservation. Um, so even though there are losses on grounds of shaking relations further with Russia, even though there might be some diplomatic losses, maybe some uh, political capital losses and soft power because there's these uh, economic sanctions being imposed and whatever else. I think the bigger loss is ideological here. The loss is, yeah. again, the remembrance that we are not living in those utopian um, states where we can, you know, look at the realpolitik textbooks and say, oh, you know, let's just wait for them to stack the dust and we will put them in that shelf of the library of books that we haven't read or we wish we never read or as tokens and artifacts of, of the human past or something like that. No, these are extraordinarily active practices and that still dictate the anarchic um, state of global politics. So I think this is the opportunity for the West to transform these soft power losses into hard power victories by reminding themselves that they have won the wars for a reason, to remind themselves that this is not the time and space to negotiate ideas and exchange flowers, but this is the time and space to remind yourself about the importance of energy infrastructure, to remind yourselves about the importance of having a strong military in all aspects, most importantly to up the game on cybersecurity and uh, not give in to these kind of pro-Russian attitudes that are being developed throughout the West. Remind yourselves that if you are in favor of democracies to do opt in to, yes, preserve the ideas and values of democracy, but also realize that they don't come for free and they are at stake if we are going to give in to Russian bulliness. So this is what I would have to say about the win-loss kind of um, analysis, yeah. And I think those are very, very, I, I think the last parts of what you said were very insightful that this is a wake up call that the neoliberal globalized order that succeeded throughout the 1990s and that culminated in 9-11, that those days are now over, like you very rightly said. And I think the rise of autocrats like Orban or Putin or Xi Jinping or Modi or, or uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, I think they do point to long-term trends of people being dissatisfied with the economic mismanagement that neoliberal capitalist policies have brought. So I think that is a very insightful point, yes. And of course, this is a wake up call for the West that you can no longer rely upon your soft power to manipulate and bully allies. Like for instance, in this particular situation, I actually feel very uncomfortable for Ukraine because they're the ones who are facing the brunt of the invasion, but they are also the ones who are not currently wanted by the EU or the NATO. They have merely been used as you know, bargaining chips or pawns on some geopolitical calculus. So I think, yes, this is an important time for them, for the West to transform its foreign policy and outlook in general. We cannot, we cannot pick and drop issues as it as and when it becomes convenient. And we cannot hide behind uncomfortable realities that you set up the financial system, which are benefiting the oligarchs in the first place, whom you are now sanctioning, even though you know it's not going to work. 
So uh, I think very interesting points you've raised and uh, uh, those are very illuminating, especially what you said about Poland and Romania. Um, and just one final comment is that uh, I really hope that there is no more violence in Ukraine any further. And I mean, I am, I'm not really sure about how the political or diplomatic situation is going to continue, but I really hope, do hope there are no more further loss of lives. I think uh, we can all hope for peace. We have bigger issues as a planet and as a civilization. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> yes, and I think you also raise this really interesting point that we cannot and must not buy into the narrative that Putin is spinning right now. And I think it's also a lesson for countries like India, like we need to be very careful when dealing with foreign powers, especially the West. I think uh, this issue does reveal the duplicity that is kind of carried out, of course, not to the same extent that Russia and Putin and China does, but yeah, I think some of the, some of the moral fabric has been like kind of laid, you know, it's been laid hollow. So very insightful points, Mr. Randa. Any final comments on the situation? Any other observations that come to mind? I think I think we should just wrap it up with a potential cliffhanger because that's how you mentioned the um, also the Brazilian authoritarian transformations and yeah. whatever else. These are also the bricks if you want to look yeah. at it this way. They already have their own economic alliance that is kind of shaping yeah. the 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 counter strategies of the WTOs and the IMFs and what have you. So I think uh, we can just leave it with the open question of well, what how is India going to be affected by this? And maybe Shantosh, next time it's going to be my turn to interview you on this, on the the basic theme of hey, there, there's a lot of hard work being done by smart Indian security analysts about how uh, the Indo Pacific is going to further affect the other side of the ocean as far as American foreign policy strategy is concerned. But at the same time, we see these lurking, growing friendships between Putin and Modi. And that kind of is a very interesting yeah. kind of ambition of India to play both sides, to be on the economic favoritism of the Russians and the Chinese, and to de-escalate some tensions with the Chinese, but at the same time, to endure, to endure and enjoy the military privileges of an alliance with the United States and the East Asian allies. So I would be very interested and curious to hear your thoughts on, yeah. on where India is going to move forward as far as, as far as relations internally and continental to Asia relative to the United States and what this means for the other side of the world, which is at the end of the day, still on the same planet with all of us. Very good. Absolutely, yeah. So I think we can uh, focus the next segment on India, Russia, and China. Yeah, very good. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Thank you for this lovely conversation. Okay. And let's meet again next time. Very good. Yeah, thank you very much for your time, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you also. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Yeah, bye.